A um, couple of housekeeping items. We just returned from executive session, and I'll update you in a little bit about what we did, but we forgot to take a vote to adjourn from executive session, so uh -huh. someone wants to make so a motion. Second. So, Second. All those in favor? Thank you. Um, and before we move to, to the agenda for this, I just want to report out on what we did meet in executive session for. As you know, we've, we've had an ongoing conversation about a proposed development at Piper Shores. Um, they, we've kind of gone back and forth. We had had a workshop where we kind of came up with some consensus things we wanted them to respond to, Piper Shores. They did respond on the 21st of February. This is the first time we've had an opportunity to review the items. There were a handful of items. Um, we moved through the items tonight, and there's, there's just a couple of items that remain outstanding, but generally it was a positive conversation, so we will update you as we move forward. Um, so with that, I want to call to order this special workshop on the Pine Point Co-op at 6 p.m. Um, so it's a call to order, and those present, I don't know, Tom, if you want to do the road, <laughs> road call again, can. or? Uh, my surprise. Yeah. Councilor Hamill. Here. Councilor Katarina. Here. Councilor Donovan. Here. Chair Hayes. Here. Councilor Johnson. Here. Councilor Foley. Here, Here. just Shortly. for a short time. <laughs> Both. <laughs> So I, I think with that, what we intended to, to do tonight, this is a workshop. I, we, we've invited Peter Finney Hamill to be here to kind of give us just a brief sort of update of the journey we've been on and sort of the conversations over the past couple of weeks. Um, he's got some documents we're going to look at tonight, but after Peter does sort of an introduction and is available to answer questions from any council members, we will then open it up to public comment for anybody that's here that wants to talk about the, the proposal and after that we will we will have a discussion among ourselves and, and process what we heard and, and go from there so with that Tom Peter I don't know how you'd like yeah, to I'd proceed, ask Peter to kind of uh, maybe introduce the matter talk of some of the the intent with the drafting we've got a, a number of documents that work in concert with with each other and to the uninitiated it might be hard to kind of follow how that works and and why that might for be important. us it was hard it was it is that works. Yes. Um, and, and the, part of the challenge there is working with existing documents and kind of adding to that and hopefully improving those. Um, I will say just as a general comment uh, before Peter gets into the details, uh, the guiding principles were really uh, born from what we heard from around this table with counselor concerns, but more importantly what was received from the public. And we tried, at least from my perspective, try to remain true to those really important themes that we heard. And I guess we'll hear later whether we've struck a chord <coughs> or not. Can I just, can you hear us out there? Because I, yeah, I can't uh, hear the, because I couldn't we'll hear We'll try to keep our was, voices up. Yeah. So uh, good. Peter. Sorry. No, that's good. Oh, <laughs> is that live? Tom's mic up there live. Is that better for Peter to go up? I don't know. The, yeah. Yeah, I just couldn't hear. So, yeah, no, that's fine. I'm not turning these on. I Does it sound like that. it's no. projecting back no. here? No, oh, it doesn't. It's not on. Sound like it's on. It doesn't sound like it's on. Can you use the little microphone there? That's what I, I don't know. Is that, is that, yeah, that's it's not on. I don't think it's on. Not just a town manager. He's also an audio visual guy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have no idea, but it's that, been an issue. Oh, we just did a system why they don't put those mics out like they oh, do. Yeah. Yeah. I'll try it. Yes? No? No. Uh, nope. They no. say it's on. That's all I can okay. report. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll try to project, uh, project yeah. as best I can. So hopefully people can hear. <clears throat> you can't just yell. So, so Tom has asked me to summarize where the process on the documents is. And as you may recall, or may not recall, uh, this conversation about the uh, co-op property, the fishermen's co-op property, was started because there were a set of deed covenants that, uh, there we go, no. there it is, <laughs> thank you. There was, now, I, now I'm yelling at you. Um, there was a set of deed covenants that was baked into the title to the, the Pine Point co-op property, the fishermen's co-op property in the 1960s. And those covenants uh, ostensibly require the town's consent to a transfer of the property. And over time, they've evolved and, and by negotiation been amended 
to require the town's consent to any debt that's going to be uh, secured by the property in excess of I think it's 150 or 180 thousand dollars at the moment. So, with a prospective sale, and I've not seen a contract, I'm not sure whether there is one, but we've been asked to to assume that the property is going to be uh, yes. transferred from the the Pine Point Fishermen's Co-op to an entity called, I believe it's 96 King LLC. Um, that's right. Uh, and there, there are now pending, I believe, three documents that involve the town. The first is fairly simple, and we haven't talked a lot about it. It's a document that the prospective buyer's attorney, Julie Ray, prepared to simply uh, grant the permissions under the old deed covenants. Consent to a transfer, consent to the enlargement of the debt ceiling to $900,000. And that's a, it's a very nuts and bolts document. It, it doesn't really say or do anything more than those two points. It's, if those terms are agreeable to the town, that's basically a black and white kind of document. The second two documents are a right of first refusal because there is a condition in the financing consent in the, the, the modified deed covenants that says that the town is supposed to have a right of first refusal against the property in the event of a foreclosure. That has historically been loosely observed, but uh, by uh, negotiation and agreement, the uh, prospective buyer and the town seem to have agreed on what looks like a practical means to implement that right of first refusal, which is a freestanding right of first refusal agreement that will be executed, delivered, and recorded at closing, which will be uh, prior to, it will have record priority over the incoming mortgage. So the mortgage will be junior to the right of first refusal, if there is one and if there is a, a transfer. The right of first refusal states that the town would have the opportunity to match incoming offers that the new owners may have and which they may wish to accept. It doesn't apply to offers they don't want to accept. If somebody offers them $100, the town doesn't get to step in and say, sure, we'll match that. It has to be an offer that the, the owners wish to accept, a bona fide offer. And it has a, a provision that says, if there is a, a sale of the corporate interests of the LLC, the limited liability company that owns the real estate, there's a provision to allow the town to address that kind of sale. That provision states that the town would get a fair market value appraisal of the property so that it doesn't get caught up in corporate valuations, so a real estate appraisal of the property, and that the town would have the option at that point to purchase the property either at the fair market value or uh, at the, the level of, um, uh, or actually, I'm sorry, this applies to other situations too, the level of debt against the property so that there's not a situation where uh, the value of the property, if the fair market value comes in below the current level of the debt, that would trigger a situation where the lender wouldn't consent to the sale anyway um, uh, or w would object to it. Would, would be They don't have to consent because the town's right is prior. But the lender would be in a position where they'd be unwilling to come in and lend in the first place unless they had protection in the fair market value situation where the town's right was set at the level of the debt or the fair market value, whichever is higher. So that document has been uh, sent back and forth um, with town input and the most recent modifications recognize that the town may need a little bit of time if it finds itself in position to match a market offer to uh, establish whether that is a public interest item and whether there are resources budgeted to match such an offer. It being a right of first refusal, the town is not disadvantaged in any way by this. If the town elects not to exercise or not to match, no harm done. The, the town's offer or, or opportunity here is within its uh, discretion and at its option to match an offer. So if the terms are uh, in the town's judgment unfavorable or the financing uh, budgeting unattainable, the town simply passes and the property transfers without the town's uh, exercise of its right of first refusal to match the offer. Uh, the other document that has been um, implemented is 
a lease assignment and amendment. And there is a parking lease, which is uh, benefits the, the Pine Point Fishermen's Cooperative right now, the, the entity that owns the property has a, a lease, which I understand goes back many years, but the, the last version of it was written down in September of 2010 for 25 spaces, 25 parking spaces in the town lot on what is tax map U21, lot 21, this sort of big blob of a lot. And the town's uh, approach has been to try to clear up some of the historical ambiguities around the deed covenants by trying to use the lease amendment and assignment process to uh, put in some protections for the working waterfront uh, to try to um, in, uh, ensure that the parking lease has a module in it where there is a substantial rent credit that goes to the tenant. So a, a meaningful uh, credit is, is applied if working waterfront covenants are observed. And the working waterfront covenants that are uh, concerned in this lease amendment pertain to arrangements to allow some continued use of the bait storage facility currently on the property and uh, to allow or, or um, observe certain structures and sort of fair dealing covenants regarding seafood purchasing. And those covenants and conditions have been the subject of a lot of input a lot of discussion. Uh, there have been stakeholder comments that have come in, and the council has processed and reflected um, many of those comments in these drafts and tried to balance in the negotiation the concerns of stakeholders who are not the purchasers, along with some of the concerns of the stakeholder who would be the prospective purchaser. Uh, it's been a, a somewhat involved negotiation, but well represented um, on the buyer's side uh, by Julie Ray. And there seems to be, <coughs> in the last draft that the council sent across, a general framework of agreement for the buyers to accept the terms of the assignment, assumption amendment of the parking lease agreement. They checked with their lender, who had some questions about it, but seems to have worked through those questions so that the terms which are in that last draft, I'm, I'm told by uh, Julie Ray, are likely to be accepted um, by their lender. So. That is the structure of the, um, the paperwork. There have also been just some questions and, and housekeeping uh, emails on internal items that Tom has forwarded to me, questions that have come up in terms of the relationship of this whole uh, series of documents and pieces of property to uh, working waterfront zoning, to the working waterfront um, agreement or covenant document, which the town signed at the end of 2010, uh, and I, I continue to work on some of the questions that the town has, which have come up in prior workshops and council meetings pertaining to the, a very old document called a writ of mandamus, mm -hmm. which you may remember I discussed. The archives uh, has tried to make arrangements for us to come look at that document. Those arrangements coincided with a construction project, so our invitation was extended and then pulled back by the archives. Uh, we tried to reschedule the uh, review to go look for the writ of mandamus, and my paralegal, who knows what to look for and has um, been in those discussions, is on vacation until uh, the end of this week. So I've been unable to secure the writ of mandamus, but we think we have a closer radar fix on it. And if, you know, fingers stay crossed in the right ways, we may have it in another week or two, but I still don't have that document. Um, that document is, is one that has taken on a, a bit of um, myth, uh, perhaps. Um, I think that it's, you know, my original analysis of it is intact, which is that it's unlikely to be a, um, a, a, a driver of this arrangement. I think that that document probably was a catalyst for the original conveyance of the property uh, by the town to the co-op, since the deed coincided with the writ of mandamus or the, the deed uh, issued as a result of the writ of mandamus. Um, but it's unlikely that real estate covenants or, or operational concerns would be put into a writ of mandamus and then uh, that document having disappeared from view, it's unlikely that those covenants 
or would have been placed there. And so I, I think the writ of mandamus, I hope, if, if and when we get it, and I think it's still a question of when, I think that will turn out to be a, a fairly uninteresting document. Uh, and I, I don't know the, the, you know the degree of comfort that the town seeks in terms of going forward in the absence of that document. That's a prudential judgment that's up to the council. But I would say that I consider it unlikely that the writ of mandamus will change this analysis, but it would still be helpful to have it. Um, I also have had a conversation and done some review with the Department of Marine Resources to make sure that they have no involvement or objections uh, to the process that's been outlined. I had a very helpful conversation uh, with Deirdre Gilbert, uh, who's the deputy in that office uh, today, and she had noted that she'd been contacted by a lot of stakeholders, that she'd been getting a lot of phone calls, um, to try and make sure that the Department of Marine Resources had attention focused on this transaction. She said, message received, we are aware of it. I shared with her the structure of the deal. We reviewed the, the state's interest in the Working Waterfront Covenant, and I told her that I was um, going to remark on our conversation today and that it would be on television, so uh, hello, <coughs> Um And that I would summarize our conversation by uh, the statement that the Department of Marine Resources remains an interested observer, but has no particular concerns and no desire to get involved in, in what they recognize as a, a um, political uh, discussion entrusted to the town council. Um, there, there was some ambiguity over whether the parking lease from 2010 was subject to the subsequent uh, working waterfront covenants, but I think Deirdre and I have talked through that and both agree that there's no reason for that to be the case. Um, the parking lease is independent of mm -hmm. the Working Waterfront Covenants, and she's um, seemingly uh, unconcerned with the analysis on that point, but does wish to, to let everybody know that the Department of Marine Resources has received the, the sort of vibes of concern um, and will be actively uh, interested to make sure that, that the Working Waterfront is a vibrant resource for the uh, town of Scarborough and they they understand that it's a very important uh, amenity to this community and that there are a lot of interested users and they continue to be available as a resource and enhancement for that. So that was that was the Department of Marine Resources um, angle. Uh, and if there are any other questions, I'm happy to take them from council or to the extent the council wants to direct that communication inward or outward, I'm happy to facilitate uh, the discussion. But I think that the issues, um, such as they are, have been framed, and um, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to ask any questions or request any follow-up that may be helpful to, to further your discussion. Thank you. So I just want to make sure, sorry. I was going to say, just before we open, thank you, that's great, and then just before we open up to public comment, yeah, counselors have any questions or comments? So uh, I, go, go ahead. Uh, see if that mic is now live. Is that one, can you tap that? No. So, are we going to have a discussion and then public comment, or you want to do a public comment and then? Uh, I, I think I wanted to use this time. If you have any technical questions, yeah. Yeah. Peter, that, that you yeah. need answers, it would be good to do that. Then I think let the public come up and have comments, and we will have a discussion after we've heard right. any any additional comments or concerns. Great. Okay. If that, if that makes any sense. So, would, does anybody have any questions for Peter? I don't know. So. I want to make sure I understand you correctly on the writ of mandamus. Uh, we haven't seen the document, but we're pretty sure it doesn't matter. That's essentially correct. That's 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 my best guess. And if asked to put a number on that, I you yeah. know again my my confidence in that position is in the 90s. Yeah. Um, it, it, a, a writ of mandamus is a very rare event, and it it generally exists for one purpose, which is to make a municipality or a public officer do a certain function. It's, it's not the kind of document that would be the vehicle for perpetual covenants or restrictions. It's basically an order that thou shalt do this. And it looks like in 1964 that thou shalt do this was thou shalt, town, deliver this deed. And yeah. they did. OK. Uh, and then I, I want to just say in general that uh, uh, it's very disappointing to me that we should have to wait to this stage to get questions answered that admittedly uh, were from a minority member in this decision, but just the same, raised very basic questions around 
what you and your firm had committed to do, and that was a title search, uh, that was to produce the writ of mandamus, and it was to provide to us a clear understanding uh, of, uh, of how the working waterfront protections applied. And you've just told us you've talked to someone in Augusta, and they're totally fine with everything, go forth, forth and prosper, and they'll stand by and talk with us whenever we need their help in the future. But let me ask you this. So your comment was, if I have this right, that these documents that you've put forward in front of the council, and that everyone has worked on quite diligently, probably with the exception of me, um, that, that these are an attempt to clear up some questions with the deed and to use assignments process to somehow fulfill the working waterfront protections. So how do you envision that that will happen with a lease that doesn't charge market value and with a right of first refusal, neither of which you're saying has any sort of review by the state or, or we're just basically redefining the state's definition of working waterfront. Help me with that. How to do that exactly? Sure. First, I certainly register your your disappointment, and I understand, and and uh, would love to have had the writ of mandamus in my pocket. But we've done our best, but it's it's been quite a bureaucratic chase. But we're doing our best, and we'll continue to, to search for that. And and certainly, um, to the extent I can facilitate uh, responses to you more quickly, I will endeavor to do so. So I understand your your frustration at the pacing, but I've tried to do my best. On on the um, the question I think that, that you're asking, and, and I'll try and summarize it if I can, how does the, the parking lease and the, the lease amendment process, how does that, excuse me, how does that provide the town with a control mechanism and an effective one to perpetuate working waterfront covenants? I think, is that, is that a fair That's summary a fair of the question? Summary. Thank yeah. you. So, so the structure of the lease amendment is that it provides, it, it adjusts what is currently, I'm told by, by the, you know, Tom and the, and the council's previous view, that the current rents for these spaces are modest as compared to other uh, parking rents in town. Um, and what the lease amendment proposes to do is to increase the rent to what is stated, there's a stated rental amount of, I believe it's 75, thousand dollars for 25 spaces but if the uh, the incentives that the lease amendment creates and I'll narrate those in a minute if those incentives are observed as the town is is satisfied with the performance of the uh, the tenant the 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 buyer it would be of the co-op property then that $75,000 rent becomes subject to a rent credit on the basis of that, I'm gonna call it good behavior. So there's, there's a good behavior incentive such that 65,000 out of the $75,000 rent is credited on the basis of uh, observing faithfully the working waterfront provisions such as are described in the lease amendment. The lease amendment is not designed to be a substitute for the Working Waterfront Covenant document. The Working Waterfront Covenant document that burdens other property, the rest of the town's property, is subject to state oversight and state interest through the Department of Marine Resources. And this is not in any, well, I shouldn't say in any way, this is not supplementing or displacing that. This applies to a piece of property which is currently private property and imposes or seeks to impose through the parking lease some similar covenants, some working waterfront incentives that pertain <coughs> to that private property. So, so the working waterfront covenant document is the town property over here. This is a separate piece of property. So the two don't necessarily touch legally, but they have a common concern, which is that it's been the council's judgment that uh, the the parking lease, the rights that the town is conferring through the parking lease, should be conditioned on uh, the observance by the tenant of um, sort of a, 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 what I'm gonna call a form of continuation of the, the usage pattern that surrounds the bait cooler and the buying station, which is on the private property. So for example, it, it describes a condition 
again, to get that rent credit, which is substantial, that uh, <coughs> users of the um, uh, commercial fishermen, any and all commercial fishermen who use the Pine Point Municipal Pier and or the uh, private landing, and who have entered into a business agreement with the tenant, being some sort of, whether it's formal, informal, handshake, contract, whatever arrangements exist on the waterfront between the, the private property owner and the fisherman, that the tenant is required to allow those users to make reasonable use of the bait storage facility for storage of bait and to observe, I guess I'm gonna say, you know, reasonable rules of comportment um, that uh, there will not be um, egregious violations and some examples that have been given, and this is not, these were for the sake of making legal points and are not attributed to, to any users of the bait facility, but if there's somebody who is disruptive or uh, intoxicated or, or something like that, that the, the owner of the real estate where the bait storage facility is located wants to have some rules that they can post and these rules will not be private. They'll be on a, you know, sort of a Ten Commandments uh, <laughs> format uh, board posted at the bay cooler, and you need to observe these rules if you are going to have the, the privileges of using the bait cooler for free. The free use of the bait cooler is something which is not written down anywhere now. It is a courtesy arrangement that has no legal basis behind it. It has no force of contract or law to support it, and the town has chosen to try to supplement that by giving it some framework, a contract which actually describes and enshrines an understanding about the bait cooler. So it's, it's in that sense, it's augmenting or, or actually um, enshrining rights which are floating around right now in an informal way and trying to couple them with this framework of the lease. The other uh, uh, sort of working waterfront covenant that is in the lease is, pertains to seafood purchasing which uh, again says that those, any and all commercial fishermen landing product who have that business agreement, whatever those arrangements may be, uh, are gonna get sort of most favored nation status, that everyone, uh, all rules and, and purchasing is gonna be on a, an equal uh, footing for people who have that business arrangement. So the general, and what it says is tenants shall generally allow sales on equal terms and conditions and at fair market value by any and all commercial fishermen landing product who have entered into that business agreement with tenant. So this is, this is again, trying to, to sort of uh, perpetuate or honor the arrangements that have organically arisen as far as those have been relayed to me through the town process. And if those, um, those uh, uh, behaviors are exhibited and, and sort of, I don't wanna say the rules followed, but if the model works, um, then the tenant and the proprietor of that private uh, station gets a substantial rent credit. If there are individual users who violate the rules, we've come up with a, I think it was described best as a progressive discipline uh, sort of system, so that people, fishermen and stakeholders in that community do not have their rights abruptly taken, that there is a warning uh, system for rule violations, first and second warnings, the second warning goes to the town, except in the case of conspicuous, you know, sort of public safety violations of the kind I described. Um, and then there is also a, uh, a reporting element of this for the seafood purchasing, where there's gonna be uh, a, a sort of accounting of sales, yearly sales. They'll be given to the town upon request, so we didn't make it like an automatic pitfall for anybody that if they miss their reporting deadline, they're in lobster jail. Um, you know, the, the, town, the town needs to request an annual report, and then the proprietors of the, uh, the buying station will report to the town the volume of purchases and the number of sellers. And that's designed to give the town a sense in a written document of what the, the system is working, you know, how well it's doing, and, and what, the, uh, what the, the participation rate has been. So these, again, are, are designed to, to complement, I'll say, the working waterfront uh, covenant property that surrounds this. So just a follow-up question. How can it complement if you're arguing that the parking lease itself does, is not covered by the working waterfront covenants? Okay, I just, that's, a, that's a major gap for sure. me. Sure. Yeah, let, let's, let's take a look if, if the council can, has the, the, I don't know if you have the document with you, but um, the working waterfront covenant document 
has a, a pretty careful definition of the property that it describes. Mm. It runs, it's, it describes two tax lots um, or a couple of deeds, it's actually, which describes two tax lots, 93 and 94 King Street. But for one of them, it says it's the portions of the property that's described. And those portions of the property that are, are affected are on what's exhibit A1 to that document. Exhibit A1 to that document shows a large section of the parking lot corresponding generally, I think, with, with the southerly, mm -hmm. do I have that right? Mm -hmm. Southerly portion of it, mm -hmm. uh, which is exempt mm -hmm. from the covenant document. That area contains something on the order of 30 spaces mm -hmm. um, for around the edge, which seem to be uh, car sized. It contains something on the order of 20 or 25 spaces, which look larger as though they're, they're um, intended for trucks or trailers. So that's the space that's covered by the lease that, Correct. that you've just described. Right, the lease itself does not identify a location for the parking spaces, it simply gives a number. So it says there are 25 spaces. And so the arrangement is that there are more than 25, there are at least 25 spaces in the exempt location. Which is on the far end of the parking lot. I don't know what Not the far close, end. Well, I, if, you, I, you're, if you look at the map and you follow your directions out southerly, it's the far far end of the parking lot. It's not next to the restaurant. So I, I don't want to uh, burn up all the oxygen in this, but I just want to cut very quickly to a couple points and then uh, allow others to comment. But, but one is that I, um, if you've read the working waterfront model language, uh, it's 10 pages long. It's very detailed. It doesn't rely on, you know, gotcha. It doesn't rely on a penalty system. It relies, relies on an uh, affirmative uh, obligation to notify and report periodically on progress and preserving the waterfront. So it's wholly different in design and concept than what's in front of the council right now. The purpose of the Working Waterfront Covenant is to ensure the permanent availability and affordability of property for use by commercial fisheries activity. That's the first paragraph on a summary of the working waterfront and it's easy to find on the internet. And I don't see how this bears any relation to the agreement that's in front of us. Um, the other questions I would have is we've raised, you know, um, I have other hobbies, but I've discovered how to go online and look at deeds. Okay, it's great fun. And I haven't even hit my, I haven't even hit my 500 page limit yet, but I might get there soon. But others have been doing this as well. And actually I would say we've been doing this not because we want to, we've been doing it because we've been asking basic questions, you know, of, uh, of council and of the town to, to explain discrepancies to us. And rather than answer them, they've said, well, I really, we want you to edit the document that's in front of you. We want your edits on the agreements that are in front of you. So I would just say some, from a process standpoint, major breakdown for me. The, the final thing I would say, um, I stumbled across, or several people stumbled across, the fact that when the deed was recorded originally, that this parking lease was, was not included. Uh, however, it was included in a, in a later document, uh, and a more detailed plan which showed exactly the book number and page numbers for all the covenants that apply to all of the areas surrounding the property that's for sale. So would we uh, be able to get your help to correct these things so that the deed you know, uh, could be recorded correctly? And do you have any explanation for why that wasn't why it wasn't recorded correctly. Yeah, there's there's a lot there, and, and some of it is is certainly, I, I will never substitute my opinions for yours or the council's in terms of, of the adequacy of these explanations. That's that's certainly your conclusion to, to draw. But if the, the council wishes to do a, a sort of a technical amendment to the working waterfront document, I, I don't think the Department of Marine Resources would object to that. And I can see some opportunities to do that, that there was, uh, at the time that document was recorded, when you look at those deeds, which you've done, uh, there was a lot of stuff happening at once. There were two and a half easements that were granted at the time. One was granted twice because of the need to make a, a correction in it. Those easements are in fact very specifically called out in the Working Waterfront document. They're, they are uh, enumerated and specifically identified 
in the working waterfront document, but the page numbers are wrong, for example. Right? They, they use instrument number <coughs> instead of book number. Somebody had the wrong, you know, look at it. And, and you know, to, to be clear, my office was one of the three attorneys working on that, and it would have been nice if, if we had picked that up. Hope Hilton for the state uh, was working on that, and then I believe somebody else for Coastal Enterprises was, was involved in looking at it. Um, it. It got through review with those technical errors in it. They seem um, not to, to evidence misunderstanding. They, they evidence imperfections in the process, and so I think that a technical amendment would do no harm. <clears throat> and if that's something that, that's the council's judgment to, uh, to approach with uh, the marine resources, like I said, I think that, that could Great. do some good and would probably be unobjectionable. Thank you. So I'll just end with that. I'd like to you know, ask that the council consider correcting the record and making sure that all the documents that you know, should be included are included, in, uh, primarily the ones that are covered by the working waterfront covenants and the ones that have very specific requirements for those. And those would be the two parking areas that are owned by the town so that there's no confusion going forward in terms of exactly where the spaces should be, should be uh, provided for, for the buyer. And, and I would just say, we, I, I, know I, I really hate being in this box of finding fault. Okay? I really, it's a, not a good place to be for me personally or for my role as a counselor. However, when there are questions raised about town liability that I spot as an individual, I'm, I'm going to raise those, okay? And, and I just, uh, it's just, uh, I mean, I, I don't really know what more to say about that, except that we rely on experts to help us, and we trust that they're looking out for the best interest of the entire community and not just people that are trying to, to finish a deal with some time pressure, which I know is put on them by the bank and so forth. So. Um, but anyway, so that I appreciate your, your letting me ask you direct questions, and I think you've been most forth, forthcoming. I know you've been working hard on it, um, so thank you. You're welcome, and, and your comments are certainly duly noted by this individual, and we always want to do better. So that's Thanks. valid valid criticism. Any other questions? From mm -hmm. well, okay. I guess what, can you maybe expand on some why we didn't just point to the working waterfront language in some of this lease to just to reference it as a way to as Don said if it's if it's if it doesn't cover the parking lot why didn't we just draw from it or point to it Did, is there a reason why it didn't make sense I'm not sure if if I have the full background I, yeah. I you know I came into this conversation after some of the workshops had happened and so I don't I'm not as wise as anyone in this room in terms of the history. But I think that, that what I'm aware of in the process is that there were priority issues yeah. that came out, I think, at the last workshop, which I did attend. And the priority issues were raised by a group of, of stakeholders and you know someone who seemed to be a, a pretty very effective spokesman for that group. And those priority issues centered around the bait cooler and the, the sort of the buying uh, of, of seafood product. And so, you know, that and, and trying to make sure that the status quo would be minimally disrupted. And so this was trying to take something where, you know, I don't know that the town of Scarborough is equipped to do all of the enforcement and reporting that this full working waterfront document yeah. would do. As, as Councillor Hamill points out, there are very technical, proficient, you know, paperwork requirements asked of this working waterfront document. I think what the town has gone for is a much more streamlined and, and sort of um, home rule kind of enforceable document that's something that's kind of a do-it-yourself so that you don't have to imitate the Department of Marine Resources and all the due process and administration that would be required by imitating the, the working waterfront document. It's, it's designed to be professionally governed um, and with no disrespect to, to the, the horsepower of the town of Scarborough, it's, it's different from the Department of Marine Resources. Sure. Yeah. I, I would simply, I would also note that the town owns everything around this building. Right. And therefore has control over the use. Uh, more to my point, all of that same area, or the vast majority, is subject to the working water. Right. Exactly. So I think when this issue came forward, um, the question arose, well, what's happening within the four walls of this facility that is important and furthers the working waterfront pieces. And as the attorney just mentioned, 
it really is the day piece and the right, right. And so it would be great to throw everything in the kitchen sink. What's really important are those two functions because it's we control and the covenant controls virtually everything else that happens around it in terms of providing access and uh, parking and all of those other essential ingredients um, to support the water. So with that, anybody else? So I guess with that, turn it over to public comment. Anybody that wants to come up and make a comment? Peter, maybe you can come join us, and then if they... Because we're not professionals, we probably won't be able to answer most of the questions. So we'll... <laughs> I really hope <clears throat> that you will give me a little uh, freedom here. Or... I'm just aghast at what I've heard. Um, for years, our waterfront. I, I came with a speech. Yeah, no. Can you just uh, can you name an address, name? please? Yeah. Can you yeah. give us your our name? Our waterfront. Can you just give us your name? Existed. Can you just give us your name and address? Before? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no problem. Pauline Levin. Thank you. Um, the water, the waterfront has existed for quite a while with its lobstermen, and they've been apparently doing fine, but now when they come. In the spring, they're going to be faced with this long document with paragraphs about what they're supposed to do and what they can't do and how they have to sign agreements and how they'll have to obey the signs about the bait shop. And all of it is written so that they are not kind of upstanding citizens. And I know you didn't mean to say that they're drunkards and so forth, but that's how it sounds, and that's, that's how the attitude might be. These people have been working hard, diligently, and they deserve to come without being knocked down with unnecessary um, paragraphs that are designed to enforce a certain behavior and covered up with the $65,000 refund and from the $75,000 refund. So that's my steam. But I'm here to talk about protecting the Pine Point working waterfront. And any instrument that you're going to sign that affects the health and well-being of this working waterfront should be really carefully scrutinized from all points of view. Unfortunately, the past is strewn with unintended mistakes or omissions. For example, there was an easement in October of 2010 regarding access to the town and the co-op at the waterfront. It was left out of the deed. Unintended things happen, and some are easier to fix than others. Simple mistakes can cause actions that sacrifice or push out our local fishermen. And that would end the waterfront. A working waterfront needs commercial fishermen. And I think our town manager believes he already has a document that does protect them. I just happen to disagree. Do you on the council have a clear cut, agreed upon goal in this matter? And is that goal protection of our robust working waterfront plus introducing a new business next door? Or is the goal to dress up and modernize the pier and observe mm, any impact on the working waterfront? I don't know. Maybe you don't even have a goal altogether. But the fact is we have a working waterfront and I assume the town, the state, and most Pine Point residents, fishermen, and sundry others would like to keep it. And so the risk, the trick, is to create a document that gives security of continuity for the waterfront while at the same time adding this new business. In December 2010, as has already been mentioned, Tom Hall signed this working waterfront covenant and right to first refusal for the town with the state of Maine and with its land for Maine Future Board. 
It was signed after the town deeded the lobster co-op building to the co-op, which I think it's why the town claims the covenant doesn't apply to the building designated for sale. Maybe it doesn't apply. Maybe nobody knows. I don't know. But what I do know is that that detailed, a very detailed description of our waterfront is in that agreement. And um, Councilman, uh, can't think of your name, has already uh, quoted what I was going to quote about protecting the waterfront that's in that covenant. By the way, this land for Maine's future board, which signed the covenant for the state, it gave $252,000 and the state DOT gave $165,000 for the purpose of getting that pier built, more than half the cost of it. It raises other questions in my mind. It took nine years of fundraising to get all those grants. Think how valuable and important this is, this issue that you're talking about. So now, here we are. Probably, uh, perhaps, legally, the commitment made when signing the covenant can be ignored. I don't know. Actually, the covenant has lots of helpful stuff in it. And I wonder if there is a legal or moral or ethical concern here if we negotiate, if we ignore the covenant. There's that expression, you don't know what the future will bring. In this case, we know. So please take the time and the thoughtfulness to deal with it. There has to be a better lease than the one that's before you. There has to be a lease that serves the town and serves the lobstermen and whoever you sell the lobster co-op to. Thank you. Good evening, my name is uh, Philip Reed. I live at uh, Four Lane by the Sea in Scarborough. And um, I just had two items I wanted to, to mention here. <clears throat> uh, I have read the uh, documents that have been referenced by other people here. And uh, reading the Working Waterfront Covenant and Right of First Refusal, uh, first of all, I have to say that it's quite clear what the land for Maine's future board, what rights they were purchasing. They define them well. Um, they, they reference uh, the sources of uh, the town references in their deed, the sources of their right to grant these rights. And uh, they list all the encumbrances. And as has been stated by other people, they neglected to mention the uh, unrecorded lease uh, parking spaces uh, and and you know that's you know that's a big deal and um, the town attorney mentioned that he did talk to the state and that they seem to be fine with it but I think the document implies that uh, there has to be written communication and I'm not sure has that been done or are these telephone conversations Telephone conversations today. Okay, but uh, I, I offered a follow up letter and she said no need at the moment, but that's something that we've talked about with the technical. But amendment. I think that is written in the, in the legal document. Uh, there's all sorts of clauses in there for notification. Uh, it, it appears to me that uh, it, the state at that time thought they were purchasing the rights to, to somewhat, my words, not theirs, govern the use of that parking lot. And uh, they, they entered into this, this agreement without knowing that 25 spaces had already been leased. They, in, in their, or the town in their document, or the, the state, whoever wrote this document up, said that there's a total of three handicapped spaces, 
I believe they said uh, 30 regular car spaces and 12 spaces for uh, trailers and trucks. 25 spaces is a, is a large portion of that. So, I mean, uh, so I just say I think that's a big deal. The next item um, I wanted to mention uh, is that my, my primary reason for, for being here is I want to uh, promote the uh, rights of the public and the, and the commercial fishermen to use that property. And unless there's a, a defined plan now showing uh, what's going to be done to that private property, which, which you know, is, is a matter of site review, and where the parking's going to be, we don't know, you don't know what effect it's going to have on public use. There's going to be a construction period, and after the fact, there's going to be the issue of uh, summer traffic, tourists, uh, local people who go there all the time during the summer. They buy food at various spots all over town, and they go there to eat their supper. What's going to happen the first time we have this, this conflict uh, between uh, the restaurant uh, patrons and management in terms of where the parking is and who can use it. Uh, that's got to be very, very well defined. And I think you should do all this stuff before you agree to the sale. Because after you agree to, to, agree to the sale or, or go through with the sale, um, it's going to be too late. Every, the, the wheels are going to be in motion and we're not going to know how these other issues are going to play out. Uh, until they do play out, and you've already committed halfway. So, thank you very much. Here comes trouble. Um, so, um, Will Hamill, 3 Bay Street. Um, so I've heard the council members voice confusion about this issue and an apprehension about their unique ability to approve or reject this particular transaction. And uh, I know that the council doesn't want to interfere with commerce as this is not the role of government. But I'd like to point out that if the council agrees to the proposed amendments for the parking lease and approves the sale, then they will be enabling interference with commerce by allowing a single entity to monopolize the entire Pine Point fishing industry. If you read through section six, six of the proposed amendments put forth by the prospective buyers, you will see that the fishing community's fear and the concern regarding monopoly that we brought up is very real and relevant. I find it very telling that despite all the backlash to this pending sale and all the concern that has been voiced, the prospective buyers would actually include something so blatantly anti-competitive in their proposal. The proposed amendments only seem to intensify the concerns of the fishing community. They don't seem to answer the current covenants and they should not be, these amendments should not be the basis of a $65,000 parking lease credit. Not only are they proposing to operate the bait cooler and buying station in a more restrictive way than the co-op currently does by requiring fishermen to enter into business contracts which will likely be strict and exclusive, they also want to totally eliminate the possibility of any competition or alternative that might offer the fishing community a way to sell their catch and store bait if it is found that the new co-op is too difficult to do business with. You have to understand that what the co-op currently is currently offers is very unique, very important, and that's why we're here voicing concerns, and that's why the council is here in their unique capacity to approve the sale. The co-op is an essential utility for the, um, for the Pine Point fishing industry. Um, fishermen can use its facilities, sell their catch in a manner that is free and flexible as per the nature of a cooperative. It's not any other commercial enterprise, and this isn't any other commercial transaction. This is a sale that has the potential to extinguish an important institution of the local fishing industry and further threaten and diminish the livelihoods of many hardworking residents who fish out of here. And the town council should be prioritizing the interests of these people over the interests of established successful business owners and the tourists and diners they cater to, who, by the way, will only continue to worsen the parking issue down there if this deal goes through, a parking issue that multiple committees have 
been unable to solve for as it has continued to get worse. I would advise the council not to approve the sale until it can be assured without any doubts that the co-op property will continue to remain an active and important facility for the Pine Point fishing community. Um, I also separately have a statement from, that I'd like to read from Nate Orff, who is the chairman of the Shellfish Committee and couldn't be here tonight. So, um, so yeah, um, Nate Orff, yeah, like I said, he's, uh, he's, a, he's a lobsterman and he's the chairman of the Shellfish Conservation Committee. Uh, this, and he says, um, the sale of the Pine Point Co-op is a very delicate matter that the council must deal with in a rational way. The facility that is currently operated at 96 King Street serves a purpose to the commercial fishermen, town residents, and tourists alike. That cannot, that cannot possibly replace, that cannot possibly be replaced in our town. There is no other place in the Scarborough Harbor to have deep water anchorage with direct launch access, and it is the council's job to protect this valuable resource. This property has long been a co-op, and it is the council's responsibility and right to ensure that it remains this way for generations to come. It may not be the council's job to intervene in private commercial business deals, but in this instance, the covenants give the council the right to protect our fishermen. The contracts that fishermen will have to enter given the proposed agreements are indicative of price gouging and may keep our harvesters from receiving the best possible price for their product. The currently proposed agreement does not allow for any co competing bait or lobster stations in the co-op proximity, and that is a red flag of a monopoly. The only real possible alternative station for buying lobster in the Scarborough River is Bailey's Lobster Pound. If, bait, if Pine Point fishermen are left with only one wholesaler to sell to in the proximity of their vessels, that they must enter into a contract with, um, Pine Point fishermen will no longer afford the commonplace luxury of making their own business decisions. Um, and yeah, I don't know, I guess if I have any more time, I'd just like to, to ask about the section six in this, this document and how the town has the authority to, to do something like that, to forbid competing commercial businesses if the state, if, if the Department of Marine Resources and the state allows for the buying and selling of bait or other seafood in, in that vicinity of the waterfront, how can the town um, legally forbid that from happening? So I'm just curious about that, but thank you. Can we get that question answered? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I think Perfect. there's some answering that now. Yep. Yep. I'm going to do my best. Thank you. Try and reset this. I'm audible again. Good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, somebody has a pair of glasses up here if they're looking for them. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the town has ownership of the parking lot and <coughs> currently has the ability to establish rules and and you know uh, deploy that property as the owner in ways that are consistent with uh, zoning generally it's zoned as working waterfront and uh, you know consistent with the uh, the working waterfront uh, uh, document so uh, the working waterfront document doesn't really have a provision in it that says you must allow competing bait uses it's it's a more I want to say sort of holistic approach um, for this document, which I think, again, uh, Councillor Hamill has provided the sort of essential nature, the, the general approach that that document takes. And so it doesn't get into to huge specifics as far as, you know, these are, are prohibited or prescribed activities. It has some, some um, uh, things that the grantors specifically uh, barred from doing, which are inconsistent and those are listed in section 3.2. So it says you cannot, for example, without the consent of DMR, have retail stores, hotels, motels, uh, bed and breakfast, housing, restaurants, except for the one that's there, recreational businesses or facilities, sporting facilities, and other uses that interfere 
with or reduce the utility of the protected waterfront covenant for commercial fishing business. So this again is kind of a, it talks about things that if the town were to allow, you know, uh, a tennis court or something on there, <coughs> that, that is a, a named prohibited use. That's a recreational uh, business or a facility, a sporting facility. You can't, you can't do something, you can't put a basketball court there. But if you want to start throwing sort of specific hypotheticals at this document and say, can the town, is the town uh, precluded from, barred from, establishing rules governing the sale uh, or purchase of, of bait or um, uh, fisheries products, that's not an answer that this document provides. Uh, you can you can certainly look at it and and it's up to the discretion of the council in terms of how it wishes to promote that working waterfront and what activities it wants to encourage or discourage but I don't think that the document takes a position on that being you know to, to that level of detail that kind of, of activity being expressly permitted or expressly denied it's again a, a relatively conceptual document in terms of the the activities that it's designed to to promote so uh, I I think that's a, a judgment which is entrusted to the council in other words I, I think more to the question perhaps providing some explanation as to why section six exists in the first place why is it there sure so so section six of the lease is is something where you know the the um the buyers have pointed out that there is a a somewhat you know, it's, though rooted in history with the deed covenants, what the town is, is doing here is an unusual step to take private property and through this, the means of the parking lease to create public benefits or, or rights which are uh, sort of uniquely uh, cited on, on, you know, through this parking lease, a, a private property owner <coughs> is taking on burdens uh, that are unusually strong. Um, you are, you're being given a, a sort of a, you're, you're at risk of having your rent go up by $65,000 unless you provide this, this sort of uh, public um, profile. And so given the, the nature of that and the, uh, the investment that the buyers are making, they've made the point, their lenders made the point, the sellers have made the point that as you know from their their perspective as stakeholders that the investment that the buyers are looking to make is considerable um, and that the the agreements that they're taking on are also considerable and contain a, a public benefit which is uh, sort of above and beyond what a typical private landowner would do that's again a function of the historical deed covenants and the town's unique relationship to this property but to, to have a, um, a, a, a sort of a regime that we impose or that the town imposes through this parking lease and then also have a, a, uh, a town sanctioned, town approved uh, competitive use next door would essentially render the property unsaleable. And, and that's one of those things where, you know, the, the sort of the, the unknowns are, again, considerable, that, that I think you have the sellers who say, you know, we're not going to be here forever, um, observing these voluntary arrangements. Uh, and having a, a sort of a, I, I don't want to say a, a balance, but that's, that's the concern for Section 6, that there be some sort of um, ability for the buyers to honor these rules and, and sort of to live up to them. It would be difficult to do that. That is, is I think, the position they'd like you to understand or, or which fuels that section it would be very difficult for those buyers to live by the arrangements that the town is asking them to live by if there is a competing, you know, use right next door. That, that is, a, I think, a very difficult position to, for the, those stakeholders to be in. Peter, can you talk to though? But there is that tension. And the other side of that tension is if they don't live up to those, what's what's tried to be captured in that? Yeah, that's right. That, that, that does not preclude the town. No, it doesn't. And saying if, if if they're not filling that market need. Correct. If, that, if, if they do not live up to the working waterfront covenants, in addition to the rent sanction, the rent increase, there is also 
the ability and not it's not necessarily have to happen but the town has the ability to allow those competing uses if if the, the sort of the protected market environment that is being nurtured or drawn up by this effort fails to succeed or is not observed um, then the town has the ability to withdraw that commitment and to to reserve the right to allow these competing uses right. which again are that's that's a discretionary item for the town. Mr. Chair, yes, I have a question. So, um, my question is, and I should know the answer, but I don't. Um, do we allow for sales, retail, whatever, on town-owned property now under ordinance? And so, I mean that that just popped into my head because it's a town-owned property. So, do we allow sales and whatever? Or is that a good question? It's not a good question. I mean, we don't allow permanent structures on town property. We're allowed, I mean, but can I go to the town park and sell T-shirts? <coughs> you know what I'm saying? And food trucks? And there's been all sorts of questions about that. Doesn't the town treat itself as bound by the zoning of the town? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm just throwing it out there as just a sticky wicket, that's all. So the second half of Section 6 says, in the event that the tenant shall not substantially and material comply with Sections 3A and 3B above, then the landlord may permit the use of landlord-owned parking lots adjacent to the lease premises as compete for competing bay coolers and competing buying stations. So that clause is in there specifically for the town's ability to recapture the right to allow those mobile stations. Correct. So if everything goes awry, that is the town's mechanism. It's actually one of several mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right there, there's a rent increase. There's there are renewal periods for this lease. There there is that you know that the town can allow the the competing use. These are again, it's and it's up to the discretion of the town to respond to those conditions as they may arise. Yeah. Remember the intent of these documents, and I think the the preference is that the historical practice continue, that uh, the needs of the Christian community are met within that facility. Uh, I don't think anyone would want multiple facilities if they're not necessary. Uh, you would, everyone has observed that area is in high competition. That's expensive real estate that's highly sought after. So the more we can be flexible and, and um, keep that available for parking and other general use, uh, the better, as opposed to putting up multiple stations doing the same sorts of things. So. Again, the intent is for everything to continue on as it has historically. So I had a follow-on question. Uh, it's a slightly different turn on the pattern of the conversation so far. But uh, in your in your memo to us uh, February first, uh, you spent. Uh, it was interesting to me when you kind of went through the the law concerning a co-op. Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned in there that it's, uh, you know, the Pine Point Fisherman's Co-op is a fish marketing association. I know there's been a lot of discussion about is it a co-op, is not a co-op, what do we have? Well, I mean, uh, you know, according to, uh, uh, you know, they're registered, uh, you know, as Pine Point Fisherman's Co-op uh, since 76. They're a cooperative corporation in good standing. So I'm assuming they are, you know, they are a co-op, as you described here. In, and you said it was organized under Title 13, uh, MRSA. Uh, Fish Marketing Act. So, and and you, there was an interesting thing there that you said that it allows them collective economic activity while being exempt from antitrust laws. So, and you know, may not know the answer to this, but so how does the buyer? Does the buyer fill that profile? Fulfill that profile of being exempt from antitrust laws and being allowed to, uh, you know. Uh, apply the proposed language that's in uh, the documents. So, so two questions there. One, which is, you know, and I think we've aired this out at some prior meetings, which is there are some um, compliance questions around the, the existing co-op that I don't know the answer to, uh, that, that the current structure seems unusual when compared to other organizations of the kind, yep. and whether that's the town's you know, the, the town should put on like a, you know, corporate enforcement badge, you know, that, that that's a, 
that's a function that towns typically don't have much standing right. to get involved in, which is to, to you know, we're going to spontaneously audit your corporation and find out what's your the status of compliances and you know have an opinion on that. That that would be difficult and 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 I don't know whether the current uh, entity is perfectly configured with the one that that was yeah. there in 1976. I understand. Um, they, they don't seem congruent, but I don't, I don't draw any conclusions as to, to the impact of that on the documents. The second question being, the incoming uh, buyer, such as we understand it, and, and I know its name, right, is 96 King LLC, doesn't, doesn't aspire to, doesn't pretend to be under the fish marketing. It's not one. It doesn't, it doesn't say it is. And so, so there's no, I don't see any analysis to apply to 96 King Street or 96 King LLC under the, the fish marketing co-op. It, it is not one. There's no, no doubt about that. Okay. So my question, my question would be, and this is maybe a rhetorical one or a, you know, a theoretical one or one that can't be answered, but if that is the case, then doesn't that raise other questions about the validity of the proposed uh, documents, the proposed agreements. If we don't really know for sure what they'll be obligated to do or what act they follow under or what enforcement mechanism they should abide by, you know, we've said it's not the state working waterfront mm -hmm. covenant and right of first refusal. It's something we created. We've really put the town in the role of where the state used to be. And I'm, you know, as sort of the policeman and the enforcer and the overseer. Of, and we've said repeatedly, we don't really want to run businesses. We don't want to own businesses. So I, it's a, you know, that's an open-ended question for me that I, I, you know, don't really expect an answer to, but maybe it's more of a lament, <coughs> which is probably appropriate during Lent, you know, lamentation. <laughs> but, you know, it's, I, I, you know. I, 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 respect the opinion and yep. and if there's a legal question I can answer to okay. facilitate analysis okay. let me know but I, I certainly understand okay. your comments okay and, and uh, maybe I guess just let let's let yeah, let's fine. finish public comment and then we'll circle fine. back around fine. trying to figure out what I'll be next talked steps, out by them I guarantee what, you. what next steps are so <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you collected names and addresses in case the owner of this glasses set of glasses has departed so <laughs> somebody's <laughs> looking think for them there. Pauline's I don't know yeah, That's I think they are. does anybody else want to yeah. speak this evening I'm Susan Clow, and I speak for 96 King. <clears throat> um, a couple of things to say. The first one is about the antitrust or monopoly issue. Um, with respect to Will, and he's an impassioned young man, and I do respect his um, public service, there, there is no monopoly in Pine Point. Um, MSV is a very large lobster buyer. They're located next door to the clam bait currently. Um, if the town council needs proof of a lack of a monopoly, I'm sure that we could come up with some way in order to prove these facts. But there are fishermen in the Scarborough River who do not sell to the co-op. Um, there are also, um, and, and Will's a clam digger, there are at least two other clam buyers. And although the co-op has bought a small number of clams considered, considering the large amount in the Scarborough River, um, some of which were Will's, there are two other buyers for sure in the Scarborough River. If the town council needs proof of this in order to be comfortable with that fact, um, we can move ahead. Uh, the second thing I wanted to address was the um, parking. Um, a lot of this has to do with things that happened prior to us, obviously. But um, it's my understanding that these parking spaces weren't delineated for a reason. Um, and Tim, who currently owns the co-op, is here and, and could probably speak to that. But you know. The restaurant is what needs the parking um, in order to run. And the restaurant is primarily busy at night. And it, because, as Tim has explained to me, historically, a lot of the need um, of the fishermen and clam diggers tends to be during the day, for the most part. Um, since those parking spaces aren't delineated, he's not able to go out and say, nobody can park in these spaces. These are mine. Um, which is helpful to the town <laughs> because in the times when people aren't dining and don't need them, they're being used by other people. Um, so I think that's historically what's going on. We are open to other structures if that's what people want, certainly, but I, I think that it wouldn't be in the town's interest to do that. Um, the third thing, and this one's super important, is that I really, it's very difficult when um, we have to be engaged in conversations with the town and lawyers and um, people like Will and Travis can't hear what's said because this 
information about contracts with fishermen and things like that is completely erroneous to what actually happened. When we wanted to buy this property, my husband and I want to run this property the same way that Tim and Gary are currently running it. That's how we started this conversation and that's how we meant it and it's still how we mean it. But because the process of bureaucracy can be really frustrating for those of us who don't deal with it often, um, every time we said, yes, we're going to do it, Mo, yes, we're going to, we, we promise, we really will. And Mo says, well, how do we know they're going to? Well, then the town comes up with a document. And then my lawyer has to look at the document. And then uh, Mr. Van Hemmel has to look at the document. So all of these things, the rules on the bait cooler, those weren't our idea. We said, we don't want to put rules on the bait cooler. This isn't the way things operate. This is not the way people do business. And the town says, well, we'd be more comfortable because then we can audit you and we can know whether or not you're being fair. So we said, okay, I guess we'll put rules on the bait cooler. And my husband and I were laughing about, what am I going to say? Well, you know, I mean, really? Turn off the light? Um, and then the discussion about contracts, you know, we sat down with um, uh, Peter and with Katie, who was here, that was the committee to discuss with us how to do this. And they said, and Katie even said, well, at least we would know that you're doing your part if you had a contract with all these fishermen. And we said, fishermen don't sign contracts. That's not the way business works. And they said, oh, they don't? I'm like, no, 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 it's not standard practice. So we're trying to come up with a document that makes the town happy that they are they are watching over us to make sure what we're doing is right. And we have been trying to push back saying, look, the way that Tim and Gary have been doing business is the way we want to do business. You know, the whole thing about having a business agreement, it's not a contract. That's the way it works. That's the way it works with Tim and Gary, you know. You talk to them and maybe sometimes you're selling 100% of your catch and the town said, well, I think that's restrictive. And I said, I do too because that's not mm. the way it works. Every guy has a different agreement. Maybe one guy does it one way and one guy does it another. And we need the latitude to be able to make handshake decisions with everybody. Um, so I really, I, I want to make sure all of you guys understand that this document isn't something we wrote. This is something that came out of committee and attorneys and, and our agreement in the end because we did need to agree to things so that the town can feel as though they have, they have the ability to sanction us if something we're doing is not right. Um, but it wasn't good enough for the town to just say, yep, we're sure you're going to behave like Tim and Gary. Let's walk away from this. They had to come up with this convoluted document that looks like we sat down and said, we want to write laws for the bait cooler and we want to write contracts for the fishermen and, and that's absolutely, and I hope Peter will stand up for me, that we didn't st sit down and say that was what we were looking for. We bartered and agreed on things that we could all agree on um, and that's where this came from. So I, I don't want, in the end, if all of this goes through and all goes well, we don't want to go back to the harbor with everybody saying, oh my God, I can't believe they put rules in the bait cooler because Trust me, it is it is not um, the way that we would want to do business if we were not in such a con confusing situation with town property and private property. So, thank you. Any other comments this evening? My name is Mo Erickson. I live on Pine Point Road. And um, I have a few things I would like to share. And my first question is, some, as I was trying to describe this scenario of how it all came about to my daughter, that um, the town actually sold a piece of property um, for a dollar. And, and that was just mind-boggling to my daughter, as it is to me. I just, I guess... It's certainly it's over and done with. It's in the past, and I know um, this gentleman made a little chuckle earlier when they were talking about um, that if if the sale went through and then they dis and then Sue decided to sell the property again, the town would have uh, right of first refusal or at least to make an offer. You know, and he joked saying uh, if it was if somebody offered a hundred dollars like that would be so funny and foolish who would offer a hundred dollars and yet we sold the town of scarborough sold it for one dollar <laughs> so really the joke is really on the town um and you know gary and tim i i wish them you know a That's lot of happiness and retirement because they certainly are going to be laughing all the way to the bank um and i God love them for that. I wish it were me. Um, my, next, my next thing I want to talk about is um, 
<coughs> you know, I feel, I do feel genuinely like we're almost looking for trouble setting up all these rules and regulations and stipulations that we want um, both sides to adhere to. And, um, but this is a very special piece of property. It's not just like any regular piece of real estate. This is special. And because of that, these different stipulations, I feel like we have to almost impose them to, to make sure it stays special. Um, as far as I did read some of the lease and I do have a couple of concerns about it. I know that, um, I, I think I read that the parking rental, I mean the parking lease was going to be signed for 10 years and I just, I think 10 years is a big leap. I wish it were, I don't know, five or, or even three and then let's just see how things are going and renew it accordingly. Um, I also noted that there was talk of potentially in the winter moving the bait shed over towards over to the lobster pound. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, okay, because okay, that clarifies it then. All right. So, and lastly, I would just like to say that you know the town council is supposed to work and represent the greater good, and I don't always agree that that's what's happened. I have to say, as a private citizen in this town, and uh, I really feel like a lot of business people, real estate people, wealthy people, they make, they somehow get these meetings started, and the ball gets rolling, and it's a snowball effect. And the snowball is gigantic, and then you decide to make it public. And at that point, the public has no say we all get the feeling that you have already made these deals, and I'm, I'm not referring to this particular, but I think there have been plenty of other times when this council and other council members who are no longer on, on the board have made deals that they should not have talked about before letting the public know. And as a citizen of Scarborough, I'm disgusted and sick of it. And I really feel like the town, some town members talk to these people first without letting, without getting consensus from the general public. And then they don't dare to reverse their decisions. And I wish that would stop. Thank you. Anybody else this evening? Tim Bailey, 14 Millican Road, Scarborough. And I've been a lobsterman my whole adult life. And uh, I just, I have some issues with the, the Section 6 because, um, and I fully intend to sell to them. You know, Tim and Gary have been great. I don't use the bait cooler. I haven't used it for a long time. Uh, maybe it's like a misconception that everyone can just use the bait cooler, but it's typically only the people that sell to the co-op that have used it. So it's not a public place to keep everyone's bait <clears throat> so it's shouldn't be new to everybody that oh my god everyone's getting kicked out of the bait cooler unless you sell there that's the way it's been and that's the way it should be so um what i have issues with is and, and also not everyone sells to the co-op they're great and they will buy from whoever typically um <clears throat> there are other people that do buy or that do sell elsewhere and the issue that i have is if it's really hot in the summer, like 95 degrees, and a lobster truck wants to come down and buy from somebody that's, say they've sold in Portland, and it's like, you guys, you know, the water's 70 degrees, it's 95 degrees out, could you send a truck today to pick up my lobsters so they won't die? <clears throat> I'd like to see that that would be allowed. Not necessarily something that I would do, but it's an issue also. If you get in and it's, you know, you fish and it's 25 degrees all day, and then it, it's, you know, it's getting to be like 10. You get in, it's dark. They won't live to go to Portland. Right. They're going to freeze. They're going to die. You might need a truck to come down and pick those up. You know, if you are one of those guys that don't, that haven't sold to the co-op and you don't intend to. Um, <clears throat> so I think there might be some exceptions to that part of the rule. Um, also, as far as bait, uh, it's a storage place. 
And it's, you guys, are you, are you going to sell bait? <clears throat> See what they wanted. Right. So now they don't, you know, co-op doesn't sell bait. They just, they're not in the bait business. They say this is, you guys figure out who gets to put bait where and how much, you know, you want to put in there and all and stuff like that. So if they do start to sell bait, um, we catch the last few summers we've caught uh, bait and sold, you know, locally to friends of ours and to people. And, and so I don't know how that would affect us being someone that would supply bait. And would we have, if we were in an agreement to sell uh, lobsters, would we have to sell our bait? In which we wouldn't have a, a problem selling some bait, but the co-op, it says it's 75 barrels capacity in the co-op, and we catch about 400 barrels mm -hmm. a week. So I don't, they wouldn't have the capacity to hold it. So we'd have to sell somewhere else, and we don't want to cause problems with that. So um, <clears throat> again, we sell to an, a bait company in Portland. I'd like to see them be able to come down and take a truckload of bait if, if we have a, you know, we typically have a truck that runs, that we send, and, but if it breaks down, they do have trucks in Portland that they could send out to carry our bait out. We're not looking to have them park it in the parking lot all the time. And, you know, and also with the, you know, the buying of lobsters on the hot, really severe heat or cold, it's, you know, it's not something that they're going to park their truck there in the parking lot and compete with you guys. It's just a once in a while thing. And uh, <clears throat> those are the issues that I have. It's, you know, I'd like <clears throat> to see if some uh, allowance in that ordinance for that type of a situation. Um, and that's, that's really all I have to say. I don't want to cause problems for the, the well, sale. We love Tim and Gary. Who can speak to that now because yeah. that's not something that we were at all. So if we needed to change some of that language, that's fine. It's more of a sense of having something permanent. Yeah, and I, I know that. Yeah. It's just, it, when you read it, it's kind of, it's sort of vague. And that, so I agree. Tim, can I ask you a question? Yes. How often right now does that happen? Like, how often do you have somebody drive from Portland if it's an extreme weather? Mm -hmm. like, it's happened a few times. Just, uh, not like, not happen, that often. I mean, like, the co-op, there was guys that fished for the co-op. Yeah. They fished in Candy Bunk, and they would send the truck down. Right. And they'd pick their lobsters up down there. So is that like a half dozen it's, it's, times a I year? wouldn't say that's, it's, it's not, uh, it's not common. Yeah. yeah. But if, it's just, you know, if. If you have an issue and the lobsters aren't going to survive, yeah, right, right. you know the people that were buying them are going to are going to yeah. go a little bit further than they typically do. That makes sense. Um, but it is hard to keep them alive in the in the heat mm -hmm. and the. Mm -hmm. um, and also, just and I don't mean to catch off, but I just want to note that <clears throat> the restriction in section six is as to competing uh, buys and, and sells. If right. what you're describing is not in competition, is, but would a, huh? another lobster deal in Portland be in competition? I I think they would be. I, yeah, I mean, I, I know what you're getting at. I think that we agree with you. So, probably treat it in such a way that would make us happy because that's not what we're getting at. It's not just setting up a cost for the truck that stays there all the time. Right. Right. You know, so, right. once you're describing, we know that goes on, and, and that's, that is the way I'm going to lease one. Yeah, and it's, it's not, it's like you said, it's not common, or like you asked, it's not, it's not common. Mm -hmm. But there was a lobster smack that would buy lobsters out. In the ocean, and you bring them back to a place and bring them in. So, there, I mean, there's the, there's the, and when Reedy's first, the place, the um, people that own the, where Thurlow's or next to the claim bait, when they started, they did have a truck. He would come down every day, and he, it wasn't, it was probably just a thorn in everybody's side at the, that point, but um, he wouldn't stay there. You'd call him, he'd come down and get him, and right. that's always happened. But, uh, anyway, that's, those are my concerns, and that, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else this evening? So I used to sell my clams um, to a specific place, and uh, they required a pretty extreme level of loyalty. Um, that was, you know, I think that in any business you can understand a certain level of loyalty i mean you know if you just go to them whenever it's convenient or good for you and then they really need to buy your clams and you're nowhere to be found then that kind of like you know that doesn't uh, bode well for your business relationship but i mean this this place it was the type of loyalty and this is 
pretty like common in the seafood industry uh, that you know if the price if their price was consistently below market rate rent or m market rate um, and if it was consistently I mean if they if, if they were closed or if they were you know overstocked and they were shut off for a few days and you wanted to go and sell somewhere else if they found out about it mm -hmm. uh, they would fire you and that would be it and you know you'd never be able to do business with them again and that's what happened to me and I think that that's where some of this fear that we've been expressing comes from and uh, I mean I and I feel like a, a decent you know I can't speak for everyone but um, I feel like the general consensus is that you know, people want to continue to do business down there and want to be able to do business with you guys. I don't have any any particular grudge. I'm just afraid of, of that type of thing happening. And when you have that type of thing, like in you know, in relation to a uh, amenity, a utility like the bait cooler, you know, and you have this section in this uh, this proposed lease that that. In, a, in essence, basically forbids any other competition or any other alternative, then you have the basis of a monopoly. I mean, if, 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 there, if they did end up doing things in that kind of, you know, loyal, extreme loyalty type way, and you were a lobsterman and you had nowhere to store your bait and you, you know, you would really be in trouble because it's a, a really essential hub in terms of like the means of distribution. You know, some people basically, if, if, if people got, you know, in, uh, in trouble with the new owners and they just couldn't do business together for whatever reason, uh, you know, people might be really, you know, in a bind for what to do. Um, you know, I would like, you know, also bring up that it's not just, you know, bait being bought and sold or lobsters being bought and sold. I mean, there's oysters being bought and sold. There's deparation clams being bought and sold, regular clams being bought and sold. I mean, there's a lot of things that happen. And I mean, I don't think that the Baileys really would want to disrupt that. But I think that, you know, um, I think that, you know, we need to make sure that they, they could, they can't if they wanted to. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else going? Going, going. So I guess we'll close public comment. Um, so we've heard a lot tonight. Maybe just go right around the table and, and try to build a consensus about the documents we have. What are the next steps? Any anything we need to think about? Anybody have any thoughts? I do. Go ahead. Imagine that. Uh, I, I hadn't even thought about these refrigerated trucks coming in. I don't necessarily see that as selling or competing in the lot. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, it's, you know, they, they, I don't know, I shouldn't talk because I, I know this secondhand. But, um, you know, they're making a deal with so-and-so in town to sell the lobsters. And yeah, I get it. You know, it's hot. You want to get them out of there because otherwise they die and they aren't good anymore. Um, so they come down and pick up. I don't see an issue with that, or I don't see that that selling in the parking lot is competing. That's just my my sense. But that's me. Yeah. Yeah. I th I heard it referenced as special and unusual circumstances. Yeah. But it wasn't like an ongoing continuous presence. Uh, right. <clears throat> that uh, uh, they have a phone line, they show up, right. bang, they take it right. all, and, and then the next, and then they go down the street and wait, and then the, yeah. and then they get the phone call again, they come back. I don't think we ought to be allowing the system to be gamed. Right. But special circumstances, like Susan said, she's got no problem with an extraordinary circumstance like those that were identified by a couple of the speakers. And I, and I think that's, that's sort of the discretion in enforcement that the town should apply is there, there's a little bit of legislative history created when you have this kind of discussion. And that kind of unusual circumstance is not intended to be what is restricted by Section 6. Yeah, um, so 
in the seafood purchasing purchasing section, so 3B, it, it says pretty clearly that the tenant has to allow such sales on equal terms and conditions of fair market value. So if the tenant decides that she's going to undercut fair market value, she would be in material she would be in material noncompliance with the lease. Which my reading of this is then, as a town, we can immediately tell her that we are allowing any and all competition on the yeah. town on property. So I I fully understand. Well, I don't fully understand, so let me retract all of that. But I do understand the anxiety around that. But in, unless I'm missing something, that if there if the fix was in or there was a monopoly and we decided to go against fair market value, that would be an easy case to make before this council to say she is not materially complying with this lease. And I would be the first one to eagerly retract any and to, to null and void the lease. Um, so I, so I guess that's where I am with the section, section, section six. I think the first two pair, first two sentences are scary, uh, but I think the last one is theirs. I mean, from I believe I'm one of the guys that fought for this last section of this lease. Um, it's there specifically to ease those anxieties. Um, I would also say a lot of this lease is to what several people have pointed out. This, this is not going to be the way things are operated day by day. This, to me, this lease gets invoked if the stuff really hits the fan and we get involved again. I mean, we should all never, hopefully everybody involved in this lease never even has to talk about it again. If we're talking about this lease again, then we're, we're all in trouble and we're all back at this table and it's going to be ugly, right? So those are my thoughts on specifically section six. And I'd love if, you know, Mr. Hamill in the audience, if you disagree with him, Let's talk and figure out a way that you think they could be improved. Absolutely. So. Don, any thoughts, comments? Yeah, I. Uh, I mean, good discussion. Uh, I think we ought to take the opportunity to clean up uh, the mess with the deeds and everything that's recorded. You know, I think that we, uh, everyone suffered with that with this process, and uh, there's probably, you know, a, there's probably a limit to what we can do there. But I think there's some cleanup work that needs to be done. Uh, I'd really like to hear something official from the state of Maine uh, on this. So I, and this is no knock on, you know, uh, Tom or Peter's efforts to get a read from them, but um, I would, I would like to get a better mm -hmm. uh, response from them on that, particularly as it relates to things that we know are clearly covered by the state working waterfront uh, covenant and right of first refusal. The following on to that, I, it does seem to me that. There is a need to strengthen the language by relying more on the state defined working waterfront terms. And now I know they're burdensome and there will be a lot of questions with them, but I think we have more questions by, by trying to substitute our definition, a new definition of working waterfront, which does not equate in, in any way in my in, in my humble opinion, with what the, <coughs> the state has. Uh, so, but you know, the thing is, it's uh, it's really up to the producers to decide with the, you know with the parties. You know, Sue mentioned this point herself that, and this is one thing I love about folks that you know are in this business. They have a very common sense approach to things. They're not going to suggest something that won't make sense. You know, and I think that that's a credit to to Sue and Vinnie in terms of how they run their businesses and how they operate. Uh, I would like, uh, in terms of the process, we didn't really allow for that. You know, we said too many cooks in the co in the kitchen, and we're getting their input now after the fact when we're asking them to approve documents. So I think that though we've done a great job of getting input ahead of time, I think we're in a much better spot than we would have been doing it another way. But you know, is there a way to do a quick turn on this and get them, you know, in the room turning things and saying, yeah, we could, you know. Uh, we could live with that. Now, these guys are on boats, okay? You know, they're out, you know, Greg Turner's out on a boat tonight. He won't be getting in to catch the meeting. You know, so I think, you know, as we work through things like this in the future, uh, we need to make allowances for that. These folks work all the time, you know, Sue and Vinny too. So, uh, you know, I appreciate that they're, you know, this is a drain on the folks that, you know, don't devote a lot of time to it typically. So I, I think that we, you know, made efforts to try to accommodate that. I think we need to continue that way as well. You know, and I, and I guess for me, and, I, and there were some, 
And I actually thought we'd, we'd try changing the process a little bit where we started this. We actually had a workshop and we actually got really good feedback, um, pretty clear feedback from the fishing community about things they wanted to see. Um, and I think to, to Mo Erickson, I think is still here. Um, what we tried to do is, is we're really, we're trying to use this imperfect tool to try to continue the historical practice of this entity, even though it's no longer a co-op. And I think what we tried to do, and you know, I know Sue, so we had lots of conversations about what we thought we heard is they want to operate just as Gary and Tim did. That's what they said. But what we heard in the first workshop was, but how do we how do we know that? How do we trust that? And you still heard it tonight, some real <coughs> uncertainty. So we really worked really hard to take a very awkward document and say, what can we do to try to have all parties be comfortable? And I think, I think Councilor Johnson is absolutely right. I mean, if this works, we'll never be back at this table again. If, if it doesn't work, then we just didn't do this right. Um, so I was looking, I think we were looking tonight for anything we need to tighten up. And, and Councilor Hamill, I've heard that the, the couple of things you've talked about. I'm kind of sensing, Jean Marie, you're comfortable with sort of yeah. the documents? Yeah, pretty much. Council Donovan, I, you're comfortable. Yeah, although I would say, uh, with regard to the two things that Don just raised, I would rely on Attorney Van Hamel to make recommendations on this cleanup issues. Because yeah. I, I, I don't understand. I haven't tried to get into the, those weeds. Uh, uh, and on the oh, furtherance of communications with the state agency responsible for the uh, enforcement of the covenants, uh, I, I would look to uh, your best judgment and report back to us, and, and that's where I'd mm. draw the line. Because otherwise, I think this has been well done by those who have been involved and very patient, and I appreciate it. I want to say thank you to for everyone for try, trying hard. Mm. So to tighten anything that I, if I had to tighten or add or subtract, my thing would just be to take Tim Bailey's comments and somehow make sure that we're them, all yeah. in the, the yeah. special. And so unusual. we call the Tim ba Bailey clause if we want yeah, to. Tim Bailey clause. <laughs> yeah, you like that? C L E W S. I think I can speak, even though Kate, I think because Katie was at the table. I think Katie's comfortable with where we are. Um, the only the only voice we haven't heard is Sean, so we can double that. Yeah, and I think that we did we did address that, and, and Peter, you felt pretty comfortable that. We're at least in a in an okay zone with what we've incorporated and done. Yeah, I mean that that's again. There's a value judgment there in terms of mm -hmm. how much is too much that I don't want to touch. Right. That's <laughs> that's among the counselors. Because we but, can't quote you for saying. <laughs> <laughs> but but this is again. This is is um, I, I think as an overlay to the status quo. Right. What you're what you're trying to do is not tell someone how to, to run a business, it's trying to say, <coughs> as you run your business, please take these interests in mind and creating incentives and, and reasons to do it. But it's it's been a, a discussion rather than a dictation. Um, and so, you know, all I can say is is it's been fairly collaborative and, and mm -hmm. you know, the, the business which is being regulated is at the table and hopefully you know, may not be a perfect result for anybody, um, but seems to be hitting the high notes for a significant plurality. <laughs> uh, and and that, to me, suggests that it's not overly intrusive. But but that's, that's you know, everyone can draw that line where they want to draw it. Yeah. Thank you. So I think with that, our next steps is we will huddle. I know you were very anxious about us getting back to you about timelines and other things, and let us let us huddle tonight, tomorrow, and uh, yeah, because yeah, yeah, it's. I um, would be fine with this coming before us on the twentieth, yeah, uh, March twentieth, and for formal action. I think we're we're ready. I would I would agree. So. <laughs>
let's we will we will let you know. <laughs> so with that, anybody else have anything? Is there a motion to adjourn or is it workshop? So I'm not even yeah, sure so we need to. So uh, second, all in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, you said look at this.